Hello there and good morning. It is 7am. This is Sky News Breakfast. The race for number 10 is down to the final five. The former Chancellor Rishi Sunak is still in the lead, but his closest rival, Penny Morden, is not far behind. She's made the most gains after two rounds of voting. Well, that leaves Liz Truss in third place and battling for the backing of the right of the party. But in a boost to her campaign, the former contender Swella Braverman gave the Foreign Secretary her support after she got knocked out in yesterday's ballots. Now on the programme this morning, we'll hear from three Conservative MPs who have planted their flags in different contenders' camps. And we'll get the latest view on all of this from the Labour Party's Lucy Powell. It is Friday, the 15th of July. Five candidates remain in the race at 4 p.m. with Rishi Sunak still on top, but Penny Mordaunt continuing to gain ground. Liz Truss still trails in third, but her campaign has been given a boost as Swella Baverman offers her support. Another two days of rail strikes announced for August in a dispute over jobs, pay and working conditions. Extreme heat warning. Temperatures in parts of the UK could jump 10 degrees in the coming days. With warnings, hospitals could face a surge in demand. The government is told to apologise to tens of thousands of unmarried mothers who had their babies forcibly taken away for adoption. You're being judged about something you didn't do. I didn't give him up. I didn't give him away. I'm in Sri Lanka where the president's resignation has been officially announced and accepted by the country's speaker. And in Ukraine, President Zelensky brands a Russian missile attack which left 23 people dead in a city close to Kiev as an act of open terrorism. And also this morning, with England off to a great start at the Women's Euros 2022, I'll be joined by Lionesses legend Kelly Smith. And the campaign for more awareness about drink spiking is launched today. I'll be joined by Miss United Kingdom. Lauren George. Hello, and thank you for being with us. And then there were five. The former Chancellor Rishi Sunak has come out on top again in the second round of voting in the Tory leadership election, but the momentum still seems to be with Penny Mordaunt. Now, Liz Truss remains in third place in a boost to her campaign last night. Swella Braverman the, and the prominent Brexiter Lord Frost are calling for her to get the top job. Now, over the next few days, the remaining candidates will go head to head in a series of televised debates starting tonight. Let's take a closer look at the results of yesterday's votes. Rishi Sunak got 101 votes. That's up 13 from round one. 120 is the number needed to guarantee a spot in the runoff. Penny Mordaunt has gained an extra 16 from the last round. She's now on 83. Liz Truss and Kemi Badenoch remain third and fourth, respectively. The Foreign Secretary getting 64 votes. The former Equalities Minister, 49. Tom Tugendhat is last, having actually lost the support of five MPs. Swella Braverman, as we've been saying, though, was ejected from the race, securing just 27 votes. So here is how it all works from here. The Conservative MPs will vote again on Monday in the third round of secret ballots. The candidate with the fewest votes will be eliminated from the contest. There'll be further ballots next week, as necessary, until just two candidates remain. The whole party membership will then be balloted on the final two with the new party leader and our new prime minister being named on the 5th of September. Well, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP for Basingstoke and the former Culture Secretary, Dame Maria Miller, who is backing Penny Mordaunt. Uh, Dame M Maria Miller, thank you very much for being with us and good morning to you. Just first off, why are you backing Penny? Well, I'm backing Penny Mordaunt because she really is the candidate that reaches out effectively to all sectors of the Conservative Party. And we see that in Parliament and the support that she's had in the first two rounds, but also around the country. And uh, you will have seen the polling that's been done um, amongst our grassroots membership. And Penny really does uh, reach every part of the party. She's got the experience that's needed, uh, um, having been a minister um, in many different uh, departments over the last five or six years. And I think she brings that fresh change uh, that we really 
really want in this government to make sure that we can deliver on the manifesto that we were elected on in 2019. I mean, you say that she reaches every part of the party. It's not every part, is it? You will have seen the newspapers this morning, Lord Frost saying that uh, she was ineffective and that she didn't master the detail of Brexit. I mean, is he wrong? Uh, I think he is. Uh, based on my experience of working with Penny for more than a decade, uh, I've seen her to be a very effective campaigner. And although I'm a remain in my Self or was at the uh, time that of the uh, referendum. Uh, she really is one of the leading uh, proponents of Brexit and was throughout the campaign. Obviously, uh, Lord Frost decided to leave the government and is now joining this debate from outside, and, and people will listen to his views. But my experience, and I have to say, the experience of colleagues in Parliament uh, don't really reflect his comments. Um, what we want to see is somebody who's going to bring that fresh start um, and really invigorate our Parliament Party as we deliver on what is a really important manifesto. Now, um, she's also come in for some criticism, as you will know, on uh, the issue of uh, trans rights. Um, can you just try and clear this up for us this morning? There's been some disagreement and some perhaps misunderstanding exactly where uh, Penny Mordaunt stands on that. Uh, why has she felt the need to change her position on what a woman is? Um, Penny hasn't changed her position on any aspects of equalities and obviously she was an equalities minister um, and she is very uh, clear that she puts the well, it's the two main issues in this area, which is making sure that we have protected spaces for women, which is in law, um, and making sure that there's fairness when it comes to uh, sporting competitions and that uh, the sporting bodies take very clear account of the impact of, of trans issues on the way that their sp sport is performed. Uh, those are the main issues. She's very clear on it. And I, I don't think this really something just so so fundamental to some people's lives and, and so sensitive is really something that's appropriate for a, a leadership battle. Um, it should be outside of politics. So she didn't, she most misspoke in Parliament when she said that trans women are women because she now seems to have drawn a distinction between biological women and trans women. Um, so when Penny was a minister, she was stating what the law is, and the law is absolutely, as you've just said, trans women are women. Um, if, if any other candidate is deciding to, to have a change in the law, uh, uh, then, then they need to make that clear. But Penny was obviously just stating exactly what the law is, and that's what ministers have to do. But I think she's made it very clear, and I think this is important, uh, that th this is a, a sensitive issue and a difficult issue. Um, and I believe, like many areas of equalities, it's not really an issue that should be part of the political fray. Uh, we should put these things uh, above politics because, you know, the way people live their lives, whether they're gay, whether they're straight, their sexuality, their gender, is, is quite fundamental and I don't think it really deserves to be dealt with in the context of a, the cut and thrust of a, um, a fast-moving leadership context, uh, contest. This needs to be about the things that really matter to the people of this country right now, which is the cost of living, the war in Ukraine, you know, things that Penny has policies on and experience in having been uh, an international development secretary and a defence secretary and having served in Her Majesty's Armed Forces. Um, Penny has the credentials to deliver on this and those are the things she's focusing on. Well, I'm glad you brought up the, the real issues that people are facing uh, um, in parts of the country. I mean, why have we not heard anything from um, Penny Mordaunt about efforts to tackle the NHS backlog. That is a situation that perhaps is going to get worse in the coming days. Well, well Penny, like I, I think probably all uh, candidates will be making sure that uh, when she takes over as Prime Minister that she continues the work that's already in train. I mean, contenders and, and uh, for the leadership can't come in and uh, change every aspect of the way government runs. And indeed, those who are already ministers presumably uh, feel that, that the policies are strong. And I, I do think that the government's already set out very clearly how they're going to be tackling uh, the backlog of uh, that's, that's resulted from the COVID crisis and indeed many billions of pounds extra has gone into the NHS. What we now need is a leader who can put a team of people in place, the best people, uh, to be able to make sure that those policies are practice um, and, and so that's why it's so important to have somebody who, who isn't just talking about themselves but is talking about having a team of strong and effective individuals in the cabinet to make sure that issues like the one you've just raised are tackled swiftly. 
Uh, and will she keep the, the same team in place? Uh, and, and where does she stand on perhaps uh, holding a, a general election? The uh, idea is that Penny Mordaunt is a clear start, so isn't she then best placed to perhaps hold a general election and get a uh, mandate of her own? Uh, Penny's been very clear, and particularly at the launch of her campaign earlier this week, uh, is that the, the thing that the country needs now is some continuity, some st stability in government, um, a fresh start to delivering on a manifesto that is only uh, two and a half years ago that uh, was uh, agreed on by the electorate at the ballot box. So we need some stability. Uh, we don't believe that what's needed now is a general election. There is a clear mandate there. Um, and when it comes to the team of people that will be around, around her, around the cabinet table, obviously that's something for the prime minister. And what do you... Uh... How, how would you answer the, the charge that uh, Penny Mordaunt seems to sort of represent for, for people everything that they want but actually doesn't have a, a clear position on where she stands on a number of issues? How do you answer that charge? Because that is a criticism that's being levelled against Penny at the moment. Uh, I think when you're looking at a leadership campaign like this, you're looking for the principles and the values of the individual. You know, all of us as Conservative members of Parliament, when we stood in December 2019, stood on a manifesto. Uh, this leadership change won't change that manifesto and those commitments, though, of course, there'll be some fresh new ideas coming coming forward. And, and Penny's already announced. And it really, in reaction to the, the most important issue facing people at the moment, which is the cost of living crisis, that she would look at cutting VAT duty in half um, on petrol at the petrol pumps. And, and that's just one of the examples of the way we need to develop policies of the government to uh, respond to the political reality of uh, the, the, the people face today. Um, but ultimately, you know, this is about a leadership change to get a fresh and new invigorated leader in place. And that's why I'm supporting Penny Morden, because she has that broad approach and, and what we would call a one nation conservative. Uh, and Penny seconds now, I mean, how concerned is she in the campaign of these sort of dirty tricks, dark arts that may be in uh, place at the moment or may well be put in train to try and make sure that she doesn't get that second spot in any runoff? Um, I, I think you've seen in each of the rounds of the leadership contest uh, that Penny's support amongst members of parliament has grown and, and that's the same throughout the country and all of the research that's coming out and the, uh, the polling that's being done is showing that her, uh, her, her, her support, her support base is growing um, throughout the United Kingdom. Um, and, you know, this, this uh, leadership uh, contest is run along a set of lines and uh, you know I think people will want it to be a positive campaign we're you know we're colleagues together we're not uh, we're not opposing each other in, in in a fundamental political sense it is just about getting a new leader and I hope that it stays a positive campaign and certainly that's Penny's style that's why I'm supporting her she's got the sort of integrity and the sort of positive approach to politics uh, which I think brings a fresh approach and and I think a kind of politics as well which I think people watching this morning probably would welcome so of the remaining candidates, who do you think Penny stands the best chance against in any runoff? Um, look, all of my colleagues who are standing for election are just that, colleagues. And I, you know, I, 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 I think all of them have got she very have, strong You must qualities. have a preference, um, De Maria. Um, I, I think that the figures would show that the prob probably the person who is, you know, has got the strongest support in the parliamentary party is, is Rishi Sunak, as uh, a very high-profile position in being chancellor. I, it's not really about who you're going to most likely win. I, I want the best person to run our country. Um, I believe that's Penny Mordaunt, and that's why I'm supporting her, and will continue to do so throughout the next uh, few days. So if she was to win and, and, uh, and then start facing Keir Starmer, how do you think she would do in some of those uh, red wall seats in the Midlands and in the North, where, of course, it's massively important that the Conservatives hold on to those seats? Uh, well, as, you know, there's been quite a lot of polling that's been done in, in the last week to show that Penny um, is the most effective Conservative politician against, uh, against the Labour Party. And, uh, and, and I understand that Labour fear Penny the most. Uh, but that's really not what this contest is about. It's about having the best person to run the country now. And then, yes, go on and fight a general election. Um, and, you know, Penny's support is very broad. Uh, me, from 
me, perhaps uh, very much a, a centrist in our party, all the way to somebody like David Davis, who is, is known to be somebody championing free speech, uh, perhaps uh, a little more to the right. And uh, I think it's that ability to be able to bring people together, uh, which will, be, will make her a winning formula um, against others in a general election. OK, Dame Maria Miller, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time this morning, Dame Maria Miller, supporting Penny Mordaunt uh, for Conservative Leader. Thank you for your time. OK, let me just remind you of a special programme we have coming up here next week here on Sky News. We're going to be hosting a live television debate with those who are vying to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and, of course, the country's next Prime Minister. The debate will be held on Tuesday at 8pm. Now, the change of date follows consultation with the candidates and the Conservative Party's 1922 committee. You can be part of the audience for the debate. Now, to get involved and to apply to put your questions to the candidates, email newsdebates at sky.uk. That's Sky News Debate, the 19th of July. And you can take part by emailing the address that you see on your screen right now. OK, let's take a look at the morning's newspapers now. We'll start with the front page of The Times, which reports on Liz Truss winning the support of Swella Braverman and that the NHS is bracing for a surge in patients as a result of next week's heat wave. The Telegraph has a piece from the former chief Brexit negotiator, Lord Frost, urging Kemi Badenoch to stand aside so that Liz Truss can have a clear run into the final two. The I reports on the way rivals have turned on Penny Mordaunt. The Mail's headline, as you can see, more than under the microscope. Similar vein on the front of the Express, knives out for Penny, they say. Not up to the job, say rivals. The Express is front page. The Metro, though, points to her strong showing. Penny's in heaven, their headline. Well, the Daily Mirror warns that temperatures could hit 40 degrees next week. The Sun reports that the footballer Jamie Vardy and his wife Rebecca have been affected by wildfires in Portugal. The Guardian has reported that the Environment Agency is calling for water company bosses to be jailed over high pollution levels. The Financial Times reports on falling incomes of two major US banks and beneath the fold the criticism of Heathrow's cap on flights coming from Emirates Airlines. Air Mageddon is on the front page of the FT, not like them, and the Star tells us that the MasterChef presenter John Tarod believes that he's a werewolf uh, because that's one of the reasons he gets grumpier when there is a full moon. OK, excellent news. Fantastic stuff. Still to come on the programme this morning as the race for the Conservative Party leadership hots up, I'll be joined by the MP Richard Holden, who is backing former Chancellor Rishi Sunak. I'll then be speaking to the director of Orthodox Conservatives about what they and other grassroots groups want from a new leader. And in the next hour, we'll get the view from the Labour Party when we speak to the Shadow Culture Secretary, Lucy Powell. Well, the Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers has announced two further days of rail strikes in August. 40,000 workers across network rail and 14 train operators will walk out on the 18th and 20th of August in the ongoing row over jobs, pay and conditions. Now, you kind of fails to have noticed that it has been very hot lately and it's going to get even hotter. Temperatures are expected to rise by another 10 degrees in much of England over the coming days with a warning that it could increase the strain on hospitals and train services. The NHS is facing a surge in demand, with wait times for ambulances in June at 51 minutes. Well, a rare amber warning for extreme heat is in place for much of England and Wales for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, with temperatures likely to peak in excess of 35 degrees. Well, in Europe, temperatures in Spain have topped 40 degrees. Seville has become the first city in the world to categorise and name its heat waves. Experts there hope this could save lives by raising awareness of the dangers of extreme heat. Parts of northern Italy saw highs of 42 degrees, worsening the severe drought which has already dried up the Po River Valley. The Italian parliament warned a third of agricultural production is now at risk and the government has declared a state of emergency in several northern regions. 
Now, a cross-party group of MPs has called on the government to issue a formal apology to unmarried mothers who had their babies taken for adoption in the 50s, 60s and 70s. In a report that's been published today, the Joint Committee on Human Rights say the government is responsible for the pain and suffering caused by public institutions that force mothers into unwanted adoption. You're being judged about something you didn't do. I didn't give him up. I didn't give him away. It is about control. It's all about control. It was, they said, for the best, the greater good. Forced adoption, the only choice for an unmarried pregnant teenager, shamed in the post-war era. Anne had barely held her baby son before a nurse had taken him away. But her trauma didn't end there. You'll never see him again. And now you can come with me and took me into this really cold bathroom and uh, made sure I was in the bath. And she grabbed my breast and started to express milk because she said, you won't need this. I knew then that I had no rights at all. The injustice drove Anne to regain control. This could never happen again. So she became a nurse gear changing to a member of parliament, promoted to cabinet health minister under Gordon Brown. All this time she had felt so alone, but the issue was far from isolated. 185,000 newborns were also forcibly separated from their parents. And now, like many others, she wants closure. An apology and bespoke support from the system that let it happen. A report released today from a human rights committee says those at the helm of power bear ultimate responsibility for the heartbreak faced by thousands of unmarried mothers. I think having endured a lifetime of being blamed, a lifetime of secrecy and shame, an apology that says clearly and unambiguously, no, 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 you didn't do anything wrong. Wrong was done to you. They say that that will be very important for them and important too to their children. The government says it has the deepest sympathy for those like Anne impacted by forced adoption and says while it cannot undo the past, its legislation and practice has since improved. Anne's past can't be rewritten, but she's since made up for lost time, reuniting with her son in 1996. She's now almost complete. It's a really big thing that they can give us back our respect. Subba Chowdhury, Sky News. OK, let's take a look at some of today's other news now. And a US government watchdog has alleged that emails and texts sent around the time of the January 6th Capitol riots were deleted by the US Secret Service. The messages had been requested by officials investigating the riots, but it's claimed they were deleted as part of what the watchdog calls a device replacement program. The Secret Service has rejected the claims as categorically false. Ivana Trump, the first wife of former US President Donald Trump, has died at a home in New York at the age of 73. A statement from her family reads, Our mother was an incredible woman, a force in business, a world-class athlete, a radiant beauty and caring mother and friend. Italy's president has rejected the resignation of Prime Minister Mario Draghi. Instead, he asked the PM to see if he can find a majority in Parliament willing to support him. Mr Draghi offered his resignation after a party in his ruling coalition, the Five Star Movement, didn't support a key government bill. The oil company Shell has warned Europe may need to ration energy supplies during the winter due to declining natural gas supply as Russia restricts flow. European countries have scrambled in recent months to fill natural gas storage for winter. As a result, prices have shot up. Well, let's go to Sri Lanka now, where the president's resignation has been officially announced and accepted by the country's parliament. This follows weeks, of course, of mass protest against the government. Let's bring in Nicole Johnson, who is in the Sri Lankan capital, Colombo, for us this morning. Uh, Nicole, I believe she is. Uh, Nicole, uh, can you uh, just tell us what's the situation like in the city right now? They've finally had the uh, resignation of Mr Rajapaksa. 
Yes, it's a real turning point in Sri Lankan politics. People have been waiting for days for this official resignation to come through. And now Gotabaya Rajapaksa is not only out of the country, but out of a job. On the streets here behind me, though, in the centre of the protest camp, you almost wouldn't know it. It's so quiet. There's been no mass celebrations at all. It seems that many people are so exhausted by the whole process, by the political back and forwards, that they're just waiting to see what transpires over the next few days. Today, we're expecting that the Prime Minister will be sworn in as the interim president. Parliament has decided that it will meet on Saturday to try and form a unity government. All of this leading up to, to presidential elections elected by the parliament on the 20th of this month. So that's where we're at at the moment. At the same time, the economic crisis here is as bad as ever. Sri Lanka is broke. It has no foreign currency left. Driving around the city, it's queues after queues. People lining up for petrol, for, for cooking gas, for food. People don't have enough to eat. Uh, the protesters, though, say that their struggle is not over. They're concerned that the Prime Minister, about to become interim president, Ranul Wickremesinghe, could end up running for president. They see him as a loyalist of the Rajapaksa family and they will not accept him in a position in the government. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. But on Thursday, those protesters pulled out of those government buildings that they had been occupying for the last few days including their main prize, the presidential palace. So for now, things on the street are very calm, but it's an uncertain environment that we're in here politically in Sri Lanka, at least for the next week. Certainly is. OK, Nicole, for now in Colombo, do appreciate that. Thank you. Now, if you uh, scan the, the QR code that you're going to see on your screen right now, there it is, you can listen to the latest episode of our Sky News Daily podcast. Now, in this one, our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn, looks at the situation in Sri Lanka and speaks to Nicole and a former advisor to the Sri Lankan government, Michelle Brooks. You can subscribe to Sky News Daily wherever you get your podcasts. Ukraine's president has accused Russia of an open act of terrorism after a missile attack on a city close to Kiev. 23 people, including three children, were killed in Vinnytsia, a city not far, a city far away, sorry, from the front line of the Donbass. Now, the moment that the missiles hit the city's busy central square was captured on a security camera. You can see it there, people knocked off their feet by the blasts and then running for cover. Now, later on in the programme, I'll be speaking to Ihor Zakovka. He's uh, one of President Volodymyr Zelensky's advisors. We'll be asking all about where the war in Ukraine is going right now. OK, let's take a look at what the weather has in store for the next couple of days. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's a bit cooler now, but as I said, it will become very, very hot early next week. The Met Office has issued a rare amber warning for extreme heat that covers much of England and Wales on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. For now, it's sunny across southern Britain, but there's more cloud elsewhere, giving outbreaks of rain, mainly across Scotland. That rain will become more showery during the morning as it spreads into southern parts, but southern Britain will stay dry despite cloud increasing. Meanwhile, Ireland, Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland will turn drier and brighter. Temperatures will be much like yesterday's. The afternoon brings with it more widespread sunshine as rain becomes mainly confined to northeast England. That rain is going to fade to leave a mostly dry and clear night, but more rain will reach the far north later. It'll be cooler than recently with some fog patches. Let's look at Saturday now, and that is going to be mostly sunny, but northern Scotland will see some further spells of rain. It will feel warmer too. It's warming up, isn't it? Sunday, we'll see the heat building, but the highest temperatures are likely to be early next week. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. All right, let's show you a bit of video here, which is a, a bit of a great escape. Drone footage has captured the moment that a seal tried to get away from being eaten by a pod of orcas by hiding in, of all places, a mussel farm. 
Well, the video shows the mammal hiding between two lines of uh, muscle ropes at Grunovo, north of Lowick in Shetland. The video is being studied by people who want to find out more about the impact that man-made structures can have on marine life. Now, the seal got away. We're not sure what happened in it, but probably mussels. All right. We're not sure. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, we'll have more on the race to become the next Prime Minister as I'm joined by one Conservative MP who is bash backing Rishi Sunak. The race is on. The contestants who would be the next Prime Minister are finalising their pitches. The prize? To become the next leader of the Conservative Party and grab the keys to the most famous door in the world. Join me, Kay Burley, as they go head to head live on Sky News. That's the battle for number 10 live on Tuesday night at 8 on Sky News, on our app, online and our social media channels. Hello and welcome back. You're watching at Sky News Breakfast. The Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers has announced two further days of rail strikes to be held in August. Let's bring in our reporter, Matthew Thompson, who's at Marlebone Station in central London for us this morning. Matthew, good morning to you. So what's the latest we understand on these strikes? Good morning, Kamali. Well, look, it's fast becoming a summer of discontent. We've got two more strike dates announced this August by the RMT union, the largest uh, rail union, on the 18th and the 20th of August. And that adds to dates for strikes already scheduled by the RMT union on the 27th of July, and also a strike date uh, by the ASLEF, the train drivers union, on the 30th of July. And both of those dates uh, happen to coincide with the Commonwealth Games, which is, of course, taking place in Birmingham, and also with the beginning of the football season. The government says that that is clearly done on purpose to try and maximize disruption. So that's the when. Well, what about the why? Well, it's the same dispute that brought the UK's railways to a standstill last month. It's about, in large part, pay. The RMT wants a pay settlement that reflects the cost of living crisis. It's about job cuts. Network Rail has said it plans to cut around 2,000 jobs, although it insists uh, none of those will be compulsory redundancies. And that's in part because of the financial burden of the pandemic. As we know, uh, the drop in passenger numbers of the pandemic uh, hasn't even recovered uh, at this point, and that's left a black hole in the finances of lots of transport companies. But it's also, Network Rail says, about modernization. They want, as an exchange for uh, pay offers, the unions to accept modernizing conditions uh, in exchange. Now, the RMT has said that Network Rail's latest offer of 5% is a paltry sum and is a real terms pay cut. And the truth of the matter is there remain, remains a large uh, distance between the two parties' positions. And the result of that, I'm afraid, is a likely summer of disruption uh, on the UK's rail networks. Okay, Matthew, for now, thank you for that. Now, more on our top story, the race for the Tory party leadership. In the last hour, I spoke to the Conservative MP and former Culture Secretary, that's Dame Maria Miller, who insisted that her pick for the top job, Penny Mordaunt, is up to it. The former Culture Secretary said that the prominent Brexiter, Lord Frost, was wrong to suggest that the former Defence Secretary wasn't always accountable during her time in government. Based on my experience of working with Penny for more than a decade, uh, I've seen her to be a very effective campaigner. And although I'm a Remainer myself, or was at the uh, time of the uh, referendum, uh, she really is one of the leading uh, proponents of Brexit and was throughout the campaign. Obviously, uh, Lord Frost decided to leave the government and is now joining this debate from outside, and, and people will listen to his views. But my experience, and I have to say, the experience of colleagues in Parliament uh, don't really reflect his comments. Um, what we want to see is somebody who's going to bring that fresh start um, and really invigorate our party as we deliver on what is a really important manifesto. Well, for more on the race to lead the Conservative Party, I'm joined now by the Conservative MP for North West Durham, that, Richard, that is Richard Holden, who's backing Rishi Sunak. Good morning to you, Richard. Thank Good you morning, for coming in this morning. So Rishi is still in the lead, but people are coming up close behind him. There must be a bit of nervousness now in the Rishi campaign. 
I think Rishi's about as far ahead as he was after the first round, but obviously now moved to over 100 supporters from the Parliamentary Party. Could have get to 120 to get into those final two places. And But I'm confident that over the next couple of rounds we'll be able to definitely make that threshold and get Rishi into the final two, because I really think he is the best person placed to beat Labour at the next general election, you know, to hold constituencies like mine, which were, you know, Labour for such a long time, uh, and we only took in 2019. Yeah, we'll come on to some of that soon, but let's just make sure he gets there at this point. So, look, where is he going to get his extra votes from? Because the, the reporting would suggest that the votes that are left are probably going to go to the right of the party, which may go to Liz Truss. No, I think we're, we're going to see another couple of rounds at least here. Um, so I think we should hopefully see some of those people. And I'll be having conversations. I'm sure a lot of my colleagues are already supporting Rishi as well. We're having those conversations uh, over the next few days to say, you know, come on, who do you really think is the best person, best place to beat Keir Starmer and stop that sort of Lib Dem Labour possibly backed up by the SNP coalition after the next general election? My view is clear. It's somebody with a record of delivering government and somebody I think really can take the country forward, uh, but in a proper, balanced and adult way, and I think that is Rishi Sunak. I mean, that may be the feeling among MPs and among yourself, but um, it's not the feeling among the grassroots, is it? Because you see, you'll have seen the polls. He's way behind to Penny Moore. He's behind even to Tom Tugendhat, who's in last place of the MP votes. Well, I think what we all know is that um, Rishi is a very, very well-known uh, character. Everybody else at the moment, you know, some of those people will not really be household names outside Westminster. Mm. I think they'd admit that themselves. And most of them are quite good friends of mine, actually, people like Tom. Um, but I really think that as this race comes down and we get into those final two, we've only been... It's only just over a week since the Prime Minister right, We've got weeks well, to go. But yeah. if he's well known, then surely he should be doing better with the, the grassroots of the party. Well, he doesn't seem I think, to be doing I as well. I think it's very it? easy to project whatever you like on somebody who you don't know that well. You know what it's like when you're starting a new relationship, you've got all these idealists. I've been married for 12 years. <laughs> 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 I don't know, no idea about starting new relationships. Uh, you, uh, you can project whatever you want onto somebody. But actually, over time, things develop and you start to think of uh, what's realistic, what's in the good of the country. And I think that's what people in my, you know, my constituency, uh, Rishi visited recently, went in an absolute storm at a AA Flags factory, um, trying a bit of sewing with the seamstresses, understand small business, because that's his family background. You know, I, I think he, he really will uh, start to connect, and uh, hopefully we can move away and offer a positive vision rather than this sort of Kind of conservative on conservative attacks, which I really don't like. We will talk about some of that in, in a moment. I, I do want to talk a little bit more about Rishi Sunak. I mean, there is there are questions. Uh, I think you would agree about his decision making because he obviously was the chancellor. He was firmly behind Boris Johnson, but there are now some questions about when he decided that he was going to try and go for the top job. Is his integrity? In question here at all, do you think? I really don't think so. Look, I was on Boris's leadership campaign right from the very start when Boris was six to one to become Prime Minister. Um, Rishi was, uh, you know, on that from quite soon after I was. You know, he really brought over people like Oliver Dowd and Robert Jenrick during that leadership election to really help push Boris into pole position mm. and has been behind him as long as he possibly could all the way since then. Things have changed since 2019, those, those heady days of early summer, about this time, three years ago. Um, and, and, and we have to accept that they have. And we now have to accept that we're going to look forwards. Who's going to be the best person to take on Keir Starmer at the next general election? That's what I'm interested in, because I need to hold my seat in order to deliver for people in my seat. And that's what I, you know, I was saying to that to colleagues across the country at the moment. And I, and you know, I think which is leading in the polls uh, and leading with MPs, because they know he can be trusted to deliver with a sensible plan. Again, it's MPs, do you think that the question about the grassroots members is that is that question about loyalty? I, I think... I think it does feel like he stabbed I, Boris Johnson in the back a little bit, doesn't no, it? No, I don't think anybody can suggest that he stabbed Boris Johnson in the back. He was very... He's been very upfront throughout this entire situation. He's backed the Prime Minister all the way through the last couple of years through some really difficult decisions over Covid. They worked very closely together. He's backed him in support for Ukraine over the last few months as well. Um, I don't think there'd be a question of that, mm. but now we've got to think about looking forward, what is the best for the country. Um, the Conservative, as, as the Prime Minister said, you know, Conservative MPs in Parliament already made their decision, um, so we've now got to accept that and move forwards. Mm. I mean, if he was to make to the, to the final two and then to the top job, you, you've mentioned that you think he would be useful to help you hold on to your seat uh, in, in Durham. I mean, do you think that's right, uh, having a, a multi-billionaire, millionaire 
running the country is the, is the right person? Because you can see where the attacks are going to come from, Labour. Sir Keir Starmer was already doing it at PMQs, and there's an attack ad out that you would have seen, of course. Uh, look, uh, look, whether it's Rishi Sunak, who's uh, wealthier than many of my constituents, or Keir Starmer, who is far wealthier than many of my constituents could ever dream to be either, what people, I think, are really interested in is who's best for them and who's going to run the country. Rishi's got a track record of supporting working people in my constituency as well. During the pandemic, the furlough scheme saved you know, millions of jobs. The, the business loans saved thousands of businesses, probably hundreds of businesses in my constituency alone. And we can see what he's been doing during the, you know, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine with those huge price spikes we've seen in oil, gas, foodstuffs. The, you know, there's cash going into the pockets. Yes, across the piece, we've got £150 for every household in Band A to D already gone through, 400 quid coming in October, but also focus support mm. on those who are really in need. And when he has had the ability to cut taxes uh, and try to drive that, fuel duty, which affects all of my constituents, because, you know, um, driving is an absolute necessity for so many of them. And secondly, raising the threshold on national insurance, mm. which really, uh, actually, the people it impacts, best of all, people earning under £36,000 a year, working hard for their families in constituencies like mine. I mean, just those the help that was was levelled during the pandemic with furlough and all that money that was given out, that is why he's been uh, called by some people uh, a socialist. I mean, is that a, a charge that you have any truck with at all? And what do you think your constituencies constituency members think about that sort of thing? Because, of course, having all that money, it's great, and it helped them out through the pandemic, but that's not going to last forever, is it? I think that's a bit of a, a, a total nonsense, and uh, I, I won't comment on uh, anonymous uh, quotes uh, in the... I mean, we know who said it, don't we, uh, uh, Anonymous quotes in the press. Uh, I, what, the, what Rishi is interested in delivering is, is a strong economy uh, and also providing opportunity for people in constituencies like mine. You know, it, people are ambitious in places like North West Durham for themselves, for their families, but also for that broader community. It's why they voted for change at the last general election. And I really think that despite the challenges we've faced over the last couple of years with COVID and the war in Ukraine, that Rishi is going to be the best person uh, positioned to really deliver that and help push that transformational agenda forwards into the future. He's visited places like concert. He's already helped me out. Uh, within, a, within 100 days of me becoming Chancellor, he cancelled the EU's motorhomes tax rise. You know, that, has, that, that saves jobs directly in the heart of my constituency. Uh, I know he'll listen to people like me and to constituent and the voices from constituencies like mine because he already has done. He's got a track record of doing it mm -hmm. and that's why I'm backing him to be Prime Minister. So he'll listen to you. Will you tell him to take part in Sky News' debate on the uh, 19th of July? Well, I'll make representations on your behalf. <laughs> I'm always happy to. I hope so. I mean, it's, it's a good thing for him to take part in the debate, isn't it? I mean, well, he's, take taking, part and he's taking part tonight uh, and he's, I think he's taking part in another one. Yeah. Um, but I will be more than happy to lobby on your behalf. Please do ask him to. The 19th of July, Sky News can take questions from the audience as well. Brilliant. OK, well, I will, I will ask him. I will ask him. I do appreciate that. Thank you very much, All Richard right. Holden. Really Thanks appreciate your time. Thank you for coming in this morning. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Well, let's uh, speak to our political correspondent, Robert Powell, in just a few minutes. But first, here's a reminder of how the process works to elect the next Conservative leader. Now, on uh, Monday, there'll be another round of secret voting held. That'll be uh, the third secret ballot. The candidate with the fewest votes will be eliminated. There'll be further ballots next week, as necessary, until just two candidates remain. The whole party membership will be balloted on the final two, with the new party leader and our new prime minister being named by the 5th of September. Well, our political correspondent Robert Powell is here with us now. Rob, good morning to you. So we've heard now from Richard Holden and Dame Maria Miller. I mean, what are your thoughts on what they've had to say about their respective uh, candidates? I think you can see the contours uh, of this contest starting to form now. Um, it is still wide open. There is a path, I think, for potentially everyone, maybe with the exception of Tom Toon, had to make it to the final two. That said, with Rishi Sunak, I think now on 101 votes, he needs 19 more to essentially get to a point where he can feel confident of being on that final ballot. So whilst that could change and there's a long way to go until those final battles play out, you, you, I think it, it is fair to assume that the most likely outcome is that potentially he will be one of the two names on the membership. And what we are starting to see this morning is really the battle for who is going to be that second name. And that seems to be really uh, at its most fierce between Penny Mordaunt and Liz Truss. And in some of the newspapers this morning, you are seeing, I think, an operation by supporters of Liz Truss to try and 
um, kind of bring the right of the Conservative Party behind her, those that are more in favour um, of kind of bolshier tax cuts, if I could put it that way, behind Liz Truss. So you've got Lord Frost, who used to be a Brexit minister in the government, no longer a minister now, though, writing a very critical piece in The Telegraph saying why he's backing Liz Truss, but also attacking Penny Morden, saying he worked with her in the Cabinet Office. He said she was absent on parade. She shied away from delivering tough messages on the EU. She wasn't accountable or visible. She didn't lead or stand up for the country. And had to be sacked and replaced by, I think it's right, the excellent Michael Ellis. That is what Lord Frost is claiming. In response, Dame Maria Miller earlier, take, being rather more diplomatic and measured in her words, I think, but still essentially making the jibe that this is a man that is not in government anymore, yeah. is not an MP, no one's voted for him, and is joining this debate from the outside, which, of course, um, he is. Now, look, this is all to be expected in a Tory leadership race, but I think that criticism does speak to potentially one of the weaknesses Penny Morden has, that she's a relative unknown. People aren't necessarily sure what she believes in. That's the challenge for her, I think, in the coming days. The risk for Liz Truss is that if supporters, especially ones that aren't even MPs like Lord Frost, continue to come out and attack other candidates in such an upfront way, it potentially looks a little bit petty. So I would say still all to play for, and there could be big changes, especially with TV debates and a weekend of newspapers to come. Absolutely right. We'll see where we are with this on Monday. More, really appreciate that. More from you later. OK, let's take a look at uh, the morning sports news. James is here. Yeah, a lot going on in sport right now. A lot going on uh, yesterday and so much more to come today with the 150th Open Championship headed into day two. <laughs> wow, calm down, Johnny. It's only a game. Brought to you by Vitality, sharing the benefits of healthy living. And it was all about this man, Rory McIlroy, sits just two shots off the lead after the opening round of the 150th Open. The Northern Irishman shot a round of six under par 66 as he made an impressive start to his bid for a fifth major. McIlroy holed a 55-footer on his opening hole and made three consecutive birdies from the fourth to reach the turn in 32. McElroy almost made eagle on the last, but settled for a birdie and a six under par, 66. In contrast for Tiger Woods, the 15-time major champion carded a six over par opening round, his joint worst ever round at the Open. This missed birdie part at the 18th summed up his day. But it's America's Cameron Young who leads the way. His opening round, 64, is the second lowest in open history at St Andrews. This birdie on the 18th, his eighth of the day on a bogey three round. Cricket now. Rhys Topley starred with the ball as England dug in to level their one-day international series against India with a 100-run victory in the second match at Lord's. Topley took six for 24, the best figures for England in a men's ODI, as the host expertly defended 246. To the women's Euros, England will be looking to make it three wins out of three tonight when they take on Northern Ireland in their final group game at St Mary's. In last night's games, France clinched a place in the knockout stages with a 2-1 win over Belgium. This goal by Mbok Bati before half-time proving to be the winner. Earlier, Iceland held Italy to a one-all draw, leaving both sides needing to win their final game to have a chance of reaching the quarter-final. Carolina Leah Vihamsdottir's strike gave Iceland the lead. But an equaliser from Valentina Bergamaschi after half-time earned Italy their first point of the tournament. They face Belgium on Monday. Iceland take on France. Cycling now, Britain Tom Pidcock won his maiden Tour de France stage in style with a solo victory atop the iconic Alpe d'Huez. Pidcock and four-time Tour champion Chris Froome were part of a five-man breakaway during stage 12. The Yorkshireman, at the age of 22, becoming the youngest winner and only the second Brit to win on the Alpe d'Huez. Jonas Vingegaard retains the yellow jersey. That's all for the sports for now. We'll be back in the next hour. Don't forget, you can catch day two of the 150th Open Championship live now on Sky Sports Golf. Handball.
Handball. Handball. Ref. Handball. Ref. Okay, more now on the race to become the next leader of the Conservative Party and, of course, the next Prime Minister. Let's get the view of what grassroots Conservative groups want. I'm joined by Joseph Robertson, the Director of Orthodox Conservatives. Joseph, good morning to you. Thanks for being with us. We'll come on to who you want to be leader soon. But just sure. uh, how, has the, how have the grassroots, in your opinion, sort of been viewing the way that this contest has gone so, so far? It's been interesting. It's been just as divided, I think, at that level as it is right at the top. Um, and I think what people are seeing now is that candidates are revealing more and more about themselves as we get down towards the final three and people's positions are shifting. Mm. Um, I think as other candidates fall behind, um, many people whose loyalties you wouldn't have expected to lie in those areas are now falling behind because they just don't see their candidate as viable any longer in terms of winnability. I mean, what do you see about this push from the right of the party mm. for Liz Truss to be the one? Sure. Well, I think that's very much um, a, a kind of concerted effort to rebrand Liz Truss. I mean, of course, at one point, she was a Remainer. Uh, and, in fact, a Lib Dem at one point in her career and, of course, has now shifted to be sugar-coated as the Brexit darling. And I don't buy that. I don't think a lot of the membership really buy that. I think that's more an internal push to uh, reposition her. Do you think the membership see that? Do you think they, they 100%. see that? 100%. I, I, right? I, I don't think they're as stupid as, uh, as some people would like to think. Um, and I think they going to be in for a very unpleasant shock if, if Liz is definitely the Brexit candidate in that final two. Um, yeah. I, so who, who did the membership want, do you think, in your uh, opinion? I mean, we've seen Penny Mordaunt yeah. like way out ahead sure. in some of those polls. Yeah, sure. So I think the, the battle is between the more liberal Mordaunt and then the more conservative Badenoch. I, I think that's the, the clear split now. Um, I think you've got Rishi and Truss as the establishment. And I think they're going to be more of the same from the membership's view. Um, we've been calling for a long time to have primaries to this because mm -hmm. I thought it was the only way that we could actually see these candidates in action, see what you know, find out some of the dirt on each of them, and have them grill each other for once. Uh, but as it is, we're whittling down, whittling down, and suddenly people are beginning to realise it's going to be stolen all over again. Yeah, stolen is one way yes. of putting it. Obviously, yes. we don't want to get too close to an American-style no, exactly, system. We're trying to exactly. stay away yeah. from that. So who are you supporting, then? Uh, so I was behind Braverman. Um, I ha I'm in a little bit of a quandary now because I'm backing Kemi, but obviously Suella has gone and, 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 and packed Truss as well. Uh, yeah, what is that so, about? How does Kemi feel yeah. about that? Do we know? Uh, so I think what Kemi didn't realise is that uh, Liz and Suella had a two-way pledge with that. So that's being honoured. Right. Um, however, so they had a mutually yeah, assured. Exactly, exactly. So if 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 it had fallen the other way, uh, we could actually see trust falling behind Suella and Kemi, I mm. think. But as it is, Kemi is the standalone, viable, socially conservative, right of the party sort of candidate, which is, I think, where the membership is leaning towards now, for sure. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the membership may be leaning towards, but how? I mean, if she was to get, I mean, and it's a long shot if she could get to the top job. But yeah. how would she? Do you think she'd fare in the country? Some mm -hmm. of those views, I don't think, would be liked by many yeah. people. Yeah, I, I mean, I think certainly from an economic perspective, um, you have to look at what the Red Bull really want to see, mm. which is internal growth. I think Mordaunt has a history, not only of not being able to define what a woman is and all the big issues that everyone's been discussing, but also, of course, of looking at sending a lot of foreign aid. She was in charge of DFID. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's a big issue. It's similar to the, the situation with Rishi. I don't think people forget uh, all this fiscal juggling too quickly. Um, I mean, I, so he's been called a socialist, as I said, it's just a little while ago. Sure, sure, sure. You, so you, I, are you I, behind I, that? I, I think I, if you look at economic policy, it's been to the left of Blair now for however many years in, in the Conservative Party. I mean, his argument, we've had to deal with the pandemic and... We have, but that, that hasn't stopped. That, that, that's, that, that hasn't stopped. You know, we're, we're out of crisis time and we're still spending. Uh, we're still borrowing, yeah. I'm sorry, we have to stop. <laughs> I could have kept talking to you all morning, but really, lovely to have you here. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Thanks.